our class lecture on development. And so remember that when we talk about development, oh, and by the way, make sure that you've opened up your chapter nine key term slides. Uh, you go to the unit four folder, which I believe I made green, go into that main folder and your chapter nine key term slides should be there. Make a copy and you're good to go, but make sure you follow along as we do this. All right, development. Development is simply put a measure of progress. How much advancement has your society had? And I think what's really important here, and as you do your example, you want to think of all the different ways that we can measure development besides just technology. OK, we can measure it in um, government. So like their laws, do they allow women to vote social progress? Um, do they have child labor laws? Um, demographics? What's their CBR like? What's their IMR like? You know, are they, what stage are they at? Like all of these show progress. Are they urban? Are they rural? So remember that we've got lots of examples of how we can measure development. Now the, the United Nations, remember this is a big group of basically all the countries in the world and they identify problems in the world and they, they try to solve them. They try to try to deal with them. And so one of the things the United Nations does is to try to keep the world peace. And they've, they've done a pretty good job so far. If there's civil wars, they kind of go and they act as like a mediator. They try to help the, the uh, innocent people be safe. But one of their other goals and one of the other things they try to do is they try to eradicate world poverty. And to that end, they try to identify the poorest countries in the world and they try to help them. And so they do this by making a quantifiable system where they um, assign each country a score. And that score, remember, is between zero and one. The closer you are to zero, the like, more likely you are in LDC. And the closer you are to an MDC, uh, you're going to be close to one. And so, you know, if we look at the highest ranked countries, they're going to be 0 0.9 something, something, something. So like 0 0.936. If you're in LDC, I think the lowest ones I've seen are like 0 0.342 or something like that. So, you know, you never get to one and you never really get to zero, but you can get reasonably close. All right. So when you see these, I'm going to give you the one that HDI uses, so the Human Development Index. That's the one that the United Nations uses to calculate their score uh, in that particular, you know, in that particular category. So if we look at the first one, right, it's a demographic factor and they use life expectancy. So remember, life expectancy is the number of years you can expect to live in a, in a given country. And so from this, they can tell people's living conditions. They can tell their like their drinking water situation, kind of uh, calories they probably intake, kind of jobs they're doing. But re remember, that's just the one that you, the United Nations uses. We could we could measure other things. We've mentioned some of those. So they're on the screen there in terms of the economic one. The economic factor that they use is gross national income. Uh, purchasing power parity. And, and basically, we, we don't need an economics lesson, but when we talked about gross domestic product in the first semester, we're talking about all the goods and services in a dollar amount produced in the United States in a given year. Um, when we add GNI, basically what we're saying is uh, this is all the goods and services per capita, per person, produced in the world. So now we include, um, you know, if Nike makes shoes in Indonesia or something like that, then that's going to be kind of in GNI and not just uh, GDP. So really, that's as far as we need to go with with purchasing power parity at this point. But GNI PPP, that's the economic factor they use. And then the social one they use, they use expected years of schooling, which is basically an average of how many years they think they'll go to school. And then mean years of schooling, which is if you know if they're if the mean years of school is uh, I don't know eight, then that means that fifty percent of the kids go you know above eight, and fifty percent of the kids go below eight years. Again, some of the other ones are, lo are listed on the screen in terms of what you could use if you just wanted to get a general sense of development. But when they quantify an HDI score, these are the four you use. OK, if we take a look at the world's map and what AP is going to want you to do is to be able to regionalize. So if we say where are the most developed countries in the world, generally speaking, they're above the equator. When we look at where the ones that aren't as developed, they're below the equator. Now, of course, there's exceptions to the rule. You can look at. Australia and New Zealand down there, you know, Brazil and Argentina are not bad, um, Chile, um, excuse me. And then 
you know, not every country in, in uh, above the equator is going to be um, some of the most developed, but you can get general uh, ideas regionally of where this is. And so if we say, well, where is, where is there a, a region that's really underdeveloped? Where, where do we have a, an agglomeration or a clustering of LDCs? And you can clearly see Sub-Saharan Africa. And then you can also see kind of South and Southeast Asia. And then, of course, that begs the question, why? Um, so, you know, why is it? And, and there's in our key terms, there's probably a key term. I haven't looked carefully, but probably a key term about North-South divide or the Brandt line. It's really kind of the same thing. The geographer that came up with this is last name was Brandt. So here's kind of the Brandt line. But roughly speaking, you can kind of see the, the, the division between the the north and the south there. Now, when we take a kind of a look at why there is a difference in development, you should probably write some of these things down. You know, why why does it look like this? What is it about those Af you know those sub-Saharan African countries, the the South Asian countries, Southeast Asia? You know, what are what are the differences in development? And so I think you know I'd probably write down a few of these things. One would be geography. The countries in the north, they just where those land masses are from a latitudinal perspective, that is the best place on earth to farm. And there's just, uh, you know, 30 to 60 degrees north, there's a lot of land that covers that band of latitude. There's not a lot of land south of the equator that is 30 to 60 degrees north. Uh, I'm sorry, 30 to 60 degrees south. And so geography plays a huge role in this in terms of agriculture. You know, what are we able to produce in terms of calories? And this is going to be a big deal when we talk about, well, hey, look, our climate is really good for wheat and corn and soybeans and all those things that make sure you don't starve. Whereas the tropical areas, you know, or these these areas back here uh, that are in the, the red and orange, they almost cannot grow corn and wheat in any of those areas. It just won't grow. Um, and therefore, they don't have storable crops that are that are dense in calories. And so they're constantly scrambling for food. Furthermore, their historically their food hasn't stored well. So, like yams, or you know, if you're in Southeast Asia, taro root, which is kind of like a potato-looking tuber thing. Uh, those things they're not overly nutritious. They're very starchy. There's not a lot of protein in them, and so you know, these people are spending a lot of their time trying to find their next meal while we've stored food and we're doing other things. We're, we're able to be more creative uh, because we have more time besides just finding our next meal. Okay, next reason, the, the, you know, those countries in the north are just blessed with good resources. So you can see a few of them there, like iron ore to make steel, coal uh, that we use to, you know, to make electricity. Uh, we've been blessed with gold and silver and all these things. And I'm not saying these countries in Africa don't have them, but you got to remember that uh, if we look at Sub-Saharan Africa again, remember that the, the Europeans controlled these areas for a long time. These countries, a lot of them are, you know, they're not even 100 years old. Uh, they're barely 50 years old and uh, they're still trying to find their way to develop They're, you know, they're 100, 150 years behind where those industrialized countries are. Okay. Also put down besides geography and natural resources, I think you should put down history of, of imperialism. So whatever you want to call it, colonization, imperialism, um, you know, and this does two things. One, it retards their growth because those countries like England or France or Belgium, they literally did not allow these countries to industrialize. They were supposed to be a source of cheap raw materials, cheap uh, resources, and they weren't interested in their development. Furthermore, remember that when they kind of carved up Africa in those, uh, you know, those meetings at the Berlin Conference in the 1880s, they created a lot of landlocked countries. They created subsequent boundaries that were not consequent. And so, you know, a lot of these countries have spent a lot of time fighting instead of getting along and, um, you know, and progressing. So there's a lot of different reasons for why there's that north south divide. But geography, um, you know, the, the climate for growing certain types of agriculture, natural resources, and then, you know, I think the, the imperialism and the way the boundaries are drawn. That's that's a pretty good start in terms of why there is development differences in the world. Okay, I'm going to go through this quickly because I think we did this in class pretty well. But just remember, when you're talking about an LDC, there's a lot of different characteristics that kind of, uh, you know, 
you can see in a typical LDC. So low income, very few services, lots of primary jobs, uh, you know, urban rural split 50, 50 NIR usually above 2.0 lower life expectancy. I think probably the stage two countries are probably now in their fifties and sixties in terms of life expectancy, but definitely lower than the seventies and eighties we're seeing in MDCs. One thing I really tried to point out is if you if your people are not productive, they don't get paid well. And if they don't get paid well, your government can't tax you very well. And therefore, your government can't provide services, services like infrastructure, electricity, drinking water, um, schools, edu right, education, health care. These are all things that these LDCs are hamstrung by because they just don't produce enough income. OK, so few advancements in technology over a long period of time, you know, consult your chart. Uh, like I said, I'm going to go through this part really quickly because we already did it in class here. Visually, you can see I think about people still living where they have dirt floors, where it's still open to the elements, where you have to have a, you know, an open hearth fire inside to heat or to cook your food. Think about your fuel that you're cooking with. Uh, it could be wood. If you don't have wood, it could be you know, something as rudimentary as manure dried manure that that has carbon in it from the grass that the animals ate. So, I mean, you're talking about some places across the world, they're still living like their ancestors did you know, 500,000 years ago. Again, you, you can see regionally where most of these are. So think of Sub-Saharan Africa, that needs to be the, the, the big region, but then South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, those, those islands out in the Pacific, some of those can be very poor areas. Those are your, your least developed countries. OK, but the good news is they are developing and they're developing because they have been decolonized. Right. Uh, since the 1960s, most of the African countries have been decolonized since probably the 1950s. Most of the Asian ones have. And so now we're starting to see some development. We see the United Nations helping these uh, countries. Sometimes they give them loans. Uh, sometimes there's foreign aid. There's a lot of people that just do things through charity. Uh, you know, Bill Gates is a good example, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation that helped drill water and, 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 you know, bring electricity to some of these rural places in Africa. But you can see in this picture that they are developing and you can see the juxtaposition here uh, of, of this kind of the old and new where you have these old huts, but they've got a corrugated metal roof and they've got, you know, the computers in the, in the school rooms and they've got some more sophisticated irrigation. Okay. NBC's, Remember, lower birth rates, lower death rates, higher life expectancy, high GNI P, uh, PPP. You're, you're probably talking over 25, 30,000. United States is around 60. Hey, really high literacy rates. I mean, you're usually going to find them over 95%, probably even close to 97, 98, 99. Very highly diversified economy, which means that we've got lots of different industries. We've got uh, a shrinking secondary sector. We've got a very small primary sector and a large uh, service sector full of what we call white collar workers. White collar workers are workers that work with their brains mostly. Blue collar workers do manual labor. So if you're like a blue collar worker, that would be more like, uh, you know, like a factory worker or, or a construction worker or something like that. But, um, you know, we have both, but uh, we typically see MDCs have a lot of white collar workers. Remember, we got low agricultural density, low primary group. Highly developed technology here, you can see it. I think what's funny about this picture is I've used this PowerPoint for a few years now and my students are starting to point out to me that that iPhone is really old. And then the other thing students usually point out is the M&M. Yeah, people, that takes technology to make an M&M. That's pretty cool. All right, again, here, when you look at the picture, you can see kind of the differences. Look at our housing at the bottom and then look at housing at the top. What I think is kind of cool in, in the top picture is you can see them develop. You can see some of the nicer houses in the back that's getting, you know, they're starting to replace those old rickety folk housing with the stilts. If you can see the stilts, that'd be a great example of folk housing. They built that up uh, because of the flooding. You can see farming from an LDC and farming in an MDC, right? You've got, got uh, oxen in the plow, guys standing on the plow, and then bottom left-hand corner, you've got our, probably like our, Kansas wheat fields or something like that, where they are just doing the work of like a hundred men with those machines. Okay. Last part here, types of jobs. And I think I went over this in class. So again, I'm going to not take a ton of time, but just remember, we're going to talk about 
primary, secondary, and tertiary industries. So primary industries involve the, the extracting of some raw material either you know, from the earth or in the earth. So we're talking four primary things you can use for your examples. My, fishing, farming, mining, and logging. Uh, those, those are all types of primary industries. And remember with an NBC, we've got so many machines to do these things. We have a very few amount of people involved in this. And, you know, typically speaking, they make the least amount of money. Raw materials don't make a ton of money until you process them. Um, that's not always true. I mean, gold by itself uh, before you do anything with it is very valuable, but most raw materials, when you process them, it adds value to them. So if your country has a choice, you're going to industrialize because that's what will make you more money. And so that's primary industries. Here you can see, uh, you know, mining in an, in an MDC. This is the Kennecott mining operation in Utah. At one point, it was the largest copper mining uh, in the in the world. Um, I don't know if it still is. I think China might have a couple that are bigger, but still a pretty big one. There you go. Fishing, farming, mining, and logging. Okay, secondary industries. Remember, secondary industries, you now you take the raw material and you process it. You change it, you transform it. And when you do that, you turn it into something useful, which is what we call a manufactured good. And typically speaking, once you do this, you add value to it. So you've got raw cotton, which has value in it, but when you turn it into a hoodie or a shirt or something like that, it adds value to it and that makes your country more money. And so when countries have the technology, uh, the capital, all the, the, the ingredients, so to speak, to be able to industrialize, humans have shown that they do, okay? Because that is, it's gonna improve society over the long run. It may make it a little rough for people in the, in the short run, when they work in factories and things like that, but standard of living will go up, people's wages will go up. Um, obviously, if every pretty much capitalist country has chosen to do this, there are more benefits than negatives to it, which is why, why we do this. And so secondary industries, you can just think of as manufacturing, okay? All right, so if, you know, here's some examples for you. We take raw petroleum or you know, crude oil that comes out of the ground and we refine it, we take the impurities out, we turn it into propane so that you can barbecue, uh, we turn it into kerosene so you can go camping with a lamp, uh, and then of course you can turn it into gasoline, which you can put in your car. And there's some other examples for you. So on the left, we have there a basic one, wood into furniture, but then we can see a, a little more highly industrialized, a little more technology there. Steel making is actually pretty cool because you're you're essentially using something that's almost like lava and you take the lava and you turn it into steel. It's not it's not that they're using lava, but that's about what it amounts to. OK, last one. Tertiary industries are, again, if you're British, tertiary. So you can you can say whatever you want. I just kind of like to say it in the British voice because it just humors me. So you just say all right. Whenever we're talking about the uh, tertiary sector, we're talking about services. Okay? Services are jobs that you pay somebody to do for you. And the, the more diversified your economy is, the, the more developed your economy is, you're going to see these tertiary industries really develop and expand. And so um, you're going to get all kinds of different services and, and what we call higher level services. So a higher level service would be like research and development, like genetic manipulation of DNA of, of crops like corn or something like that. Um, you know, biotech, um, computer chip de technology, that kind of stuff where you're, you're paying people uh, to, you know, to provide you with some, some sort of elaborate service. So what we typically see is that in LDC, they have very few services, very basic services. By the time you get to the United States, we've got so many services that most of our people are employed in those services. Okay. Now that you have to understand that the only way that you can have those services is if people have money. And so if they're not, if they're not educated, if they're not productive, then widespread wealth won't be there. And you're just not going to be able to have, you know, those, those services. And so I think, you know, really good example right now during COVID, you look at restaurants, you know, restaurants are a prime example of a service and, you know, people might have lost their jobs. And so maybe they're not going out to restaurants as much. Certainly there's the safety 
you know, the safety uh, part about it too. But a lot of people have lost their jobs during COVID. So there's just not as many people to go out and go to those restaurants. And so that service suffers. So if there's not enough money out there, the services, they kind of won't be there. And you see that in LDC is pretty widespread. All right. And then here's a bunch of services that you can, that you can use. I've put some basic ones on there for you. Um, you know, so feel free to use whatever one you want there. But the landscaper, I like that one. Uh, landscaping is really hard work. I'd rather not do it if I don't have to. And if I have a little bit of money, I'm going to pay that person to do my backyard for me so that I don't have to do it. Or cook. Um, I think that my family is going to have Dion's Pizza Night, which I'm really excited about. I don't feel like making dinner tonight. My wife doesn't feel like making dinner. So we're going to have Dion's Pizza. Thank you, services. Okay, last thing here, if you take a look at this, as you develop, right, as you get, um, you know, and th this is the United States. So if we take a look at through the years, uh, starting in 1820, primary is going down. So if you look at where the red line was in 1820, that's when you have what, 75%, 78% of your people were farmers. And then as time goes on to 2000, now you're getting a very small percentage the same time we saw in 1820 through the 1900s, you know, and really probably peaking in 1920 to 1960, we have this industrial surge where our secondary has gone up, but now as technology is getting better, we have more robots, we can start to outsource. Now that secondary sector goes down, that's the blue. And then we can see that our tertiary has been rising since the 1820s. And, you know, we're, we're right now at about 85% of our population's tertiary. Here you can see the difference between uh, a country on the, you know, the USA, uh, and this was probably like in 2000, I think we're higher than this now, but you can see that uh, tertiary in 2000 was 75%. Uh, you know, that this right here is a typical MDC, very small percentage in primary. Then you can see Brazil, right? Brazil is one of those countries that's, that's kind of on the up. They're out, they're industrializing right now. Um, you know, their, their secondary has gone up. Their, their tertiary is, you know, it's growing pretty well. And then Nepal, you can see, is your LDC. So this is something you could be asked to identify, um, you know, on an SAQ or I'm sorry for you guys, an SCR, where they say identify the country that's an LDC. Okay, uh, so I am going to stop right there and I will start in class on Monday with productivity. Thank you for joining in and have a good day.